Obscure. Now, ironically, you may not have heard of this franchise. I hadn't until I found both games on sale. They're survival horror games, similar to Silent Hill and such, if not quite as good and not as much backstory. If this is the first episode you watch, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna describe the overall concept and then go into specifics about the two games in chronological order. You control a hand you control a handful of teenagers, youths, investigating strange occurrences seemingly related to flowers and plants. As such, you don't have to be running around as the same character throughout either of the games. In fact, in the second one, you can't, but I'll get into that once I get to the review of that specific game. The survival horror ingredients are all there. You can't save completely limitlessly. You won't really find any more health or guns than you absolutely need. And that very much goes for ammo as well. In general, they're challenging. Every character you can control in both games has some ability that you activate by pressing a key at the appropriate time. I'll get into what the specific abilities are in the reviews themselves. Both games are fairly short. The first one took me a weekend, the second one only a little bit more than a weekend. The graphics are great. The games are from 2004 and 2007. So while the first one might admittedly not quite be up to today's standards, still pretty good. Oh, and if your weapon and your partner should happen to seemingly disappear whenever you open a door, don't worry, they're still there, it's just a graphic glitch. The scores for these games are amazing. They're almost solely comprised of orchestral pieces, and they always fit the mood. There's good atmosphere in both, and they're both quite creepy and eerie. While it is inaccurate what it says on the back of the cover of the first one, a game in the style of American teen slasher movies, both games do successfully emulate the experience of being in a teen horror flick. I'd say that the characters are generally more likable than in your average teen horror flick, but other than that, they pretty much hit the nail on the head right down to the teenage language. And yes, like in Silent Hill 3, it can get a little irritating. It's also kind of awkward how the people who wrote these are clearly not native English speakers. I think they're French. Anyway, some of the lines just have that odd quality to them of whoever thought this lineup clearly didn't have a complete grasp on the language. In both games, you'll spend most of the time walking around with just one of the other young people following you. The AI is quite good in both. I'll get into it more in the reviews themselves. And you can switch back and forth between which of the two you're pretty much whenever you want. You can also play co-op. These two are among the recent games where a second player can join in at any time. Now, I haven't actually tried it for either so I can't really comment on it. I can just give you my impression of what it sounds like it might be like in the roofs themselves. Both plots are pretty good. I personally would have liked a bit more backstory, but it's probably just Silent Hill that's raised my expectations for all survival horror now. The games have two different, but both very good, targeting systems for whenever you're fighting enemies. And I gotta admit, that's one of the areas where survival horror often doesn't quite get it right, and thus makes the combat more frustrating than it's supposed to be. Both games are exciting and engaging. The monster designs are really good, and both games present us with creatures that you know stand out, that aren't just run-of-the-mill monsters. Both games can be pretty clumsy here and there, but it really doesn't spoil the whole. It does keep it from attaining the level of excellence that you find in Silent Hill, but other than that, they're definitely fun. Now the last thing I'm going to say before I'm going to get into the separate reviews is that, yes, if you've heard or seen a screenshot or played at least a little of one of them, in any case, if you've come to the conclusion that a character looks quite a bit like Josh Hartnett, yes. Stan, in both games, 
is Josh Harton. More specifically, he's Zeke, Josh Harton's character from The Faculty. I'm not complaining about that. I hold no hallowed or hollow hatred of him. And call me crazy, but I didn't hate The Faculty either. Not Rodriguez's best, not Williamson's best. And yes, clearly some of the stuff in it is straight out of the thing. I personally consider it an homage, a love letter, if you will, and not a ripoff. I mean, for those who don't know, Robert Rodriguez watched John Carpenter movies and said, that's it, I'm gonna be a film director. Obviously, he respects the man's work. Anyway, yes, Stan the character is Zeke, the small-time hustler, straight out of the movie. I think they gave him a bit more teenage lingo in the games, but apart from that, and in tune with him being a small-time hustler, his special ability in both games is lockpicking. No, his ability isn't offering strawberry-flavored condoms to the monsters. A bit unfortunate, actually, because I have the feeling that they'd really appreciate it. The kind of aggressive behavior they're engaging in is reminiscent of that found in people who've been taught that abstinence is the only way to be safe about sex. Well, that was the general stuff. Now, getting into the review of Obscure. The game starts with one of the students at Leafmore High School going missing. The following day, his girlfriend, his sister, and a kid who's studying to be a reporter, I don't know, I'm not sure he's actually friends with the other kid, or... Anyway, the three of them decide to stay after school to investigate. Yes, the game hopes that you aren't immediately thrown off by the highly preposterous notion that high school students would actually go to their school when they don't have to to do some than vandalizing. Anyway, the girlfriend character is named Ashley, and she's a pretty tough chick, so her special ability is attacking faster than the others, like getting two hits off or shots off very fast. The sister character is named Shannon, and her ability is giving advice. Basically hints of how to solve the current puzzle, although they'll relatively seldom be something that you hadn't already thought of yourself. Fortunately, she also gives a real boost to healing either herself or others. Or maybe it's just when healing others, I'm not sure. Then we have the reporter wannabe, Josh. His ability is being able to tell if there's something left to do in the current area. Basically, you press the special abilities key and he'll either say there's nothing left here or some variation of the phrase there's more to do here. At the high school they meet up with Stan, who's basically just an underachiever and a good friend of the kid who went missing. His ability is picking locks, although in this game everybody can. The only thing is he's faster at it, but there's an item that anyone can use that also unlocks doors, or forces the lock. He teams up with them, and the four of them are now looking for Kenny, the school jock, whose special ability is running. Yeah, the ability in this aren't fantastic. Basically what they did with this was, you get to choose who you're going to be running around as, and who you're going to be running around with. The game never really forces you to use anyone specific. You can use anyone in your roster at that given time. Also, should any of them happen to die, you can just move on with the ones you have left. As far as I understand, you don't need to complete the game with more than a single character surviving. They actually did redo all of the in-engine cutscenes with the separate characters, Although, they made a mistake somewhere along the line because they don't all make sense. I watched the same cutscene twice with two different sets of characters, and in the second one, it actually made sense what they said. It actually furthered the plot. You find weapons as you go along, and it's your responsibility to make sure that your partner is also armed. Ammunition is shared, though, fortunately. 